So today I just, uh, I want to share with you a, a message about seeing the real picture. Seeing the real picture. And to, to share this message, I have chosen the passage from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, if you read the chapter before this, you'll come to know what the witnesses are and who they're talking about and, you know, all of that, all right? I'm not going to go too much into detail in that. It just stay with the scripture. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful scripture. I tell you. You know, every time I read this, something happens. And, you know, I'm so excited. And, uh, and God always says something else. Doesn't he do that often? You read the same verse and he'll tell you something. And then after two, three weeks, you read the same verse and he tells you something else. But that's how deep and powerful God's word is. It is spirit and life. To even comprehend that is, is difficult for our human minds. That the word spoken is spirit and life. That is why those who hear and receive in their spirits will always be blessed. That is why Jesus said, and I love saying this always. You know, when he was preaching and when he walked on, he said, let he who has ears to hear, hear. But you know something wonderful? After Jesus rose again, the Bible says, let he who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says. Amen. Jesus said, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come to you. Actually, what he was saying to them in simple words, which they could not understand, was, I go in this body that you're looking at, I come back in the spirit to be with you. He's with us always, those who have received Christ. That is why we have this great, you know, hope, courage, and, and boldness, and, and uh, you know, uh, comfort in every situation, because... The knowledge that Christ is with us is in us. God is not a God of confusion, but of perfection. No, he's a God of perfection. When he told Moses to make a tabernacle, you know, sometimes I think poor Moses, he must have been looking at him and saying, what are you saying? I don't know anything about these things. I want you to build like this, this size, that size, this size, this thickness, this cloth, this, this wood, this thing. Poor Moses. No? But God is a God of perfection. He wants everything down to the finest detail. So when you receive a blessing, it is always 100%. Not 99999 So when Pastor was saying, receive your blessings, I hope that, you know, you, you realized what he was saying, what he was talking about. Okay? Because it's it's so important for us to understand this God we speak about. To know his presence. To believe that he is here. You know, the Bible says, if two or more gather in my name, I'll be there. I believe Jesus is here. We are much more than two. And you know, if your spiritual eyes and my spiritual eyes are open, I doubt any of us would be sitting and standing the way we are. So God in his mercy, he's here, but he doesn't want us to, you know, be overwhelmed by his presence. So he says, I'm there, and I want you to believe it and know it 
so that if anything is transpiring in your life that is a problem, he says, just speak to me. I'm there right beside you. I will answer you, heal you, touch you, as they were saying from the very beginning. Praise God. So it is of utmost importance that we, you know, have a revelation and an understanding of God, his presence, his word. Now, I'm going to speak about this because, you know, most of us know God's word. We read, we study, you know, we know God's word. But that's not sufficient for us. It's not sufficient that we know God's word. What is important is that we put it to practice. And putting to practice requires faith, believing that it is true. Without which we can receive nothing. We receive nothing, believe me. We can know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But if we can't put it to practice, we receive nothing. So, you know, many people say, you know, you need to practice what you preach. I said, no. I preach what I practice. Then only can I be confident of what I say. If I'm going to just speak because I learned something, it's never going to have a revelation or an understanding deep enough for me to be able to move with that scripture or that verse or that word. But if I have experienced it, nobody can deny me. No? When I, I, I talk about testimonies and things, you know, when you speak about a testimony, how boldly we speak, because it's happened, and I don't care who's seated in the crowd, you can't deny what I have experienced by God's word. So, you know, it says there, we, we have this cloud of witnesses, all right? Those are the men of faith and people of faith gone before us. This, the line I'm going to stress on first is, let us lay aside every weight. See, he's talking about a race. We are running a race. And you know, if you look at today's modern athletes who are running 100 meters, 200, you know, uh, some of them were, uh, literally are wearing nothing today. Why? Why do they dress like that? Because they don't want even the littlest, tiniest bit of wind or any weight to hinder their speed in the race. They don't want to, you know, have anything that obstructs. So they have even, even you know, motorbike riders and you see them Formula One. All are made sleek. They have that wind cutting thing. They have, you know, helmets that cut the breeze and all kinds of stuff just so that they get that pace and speed for us we are running such a race that the bible says you got to set aside every weight and the question is what is this weight what is this weight that the bible is telling us we got to set aside it is the weight of the world and the things that capture us and bring us down every day. The desires, wants, hungers for things of this world that are constantly a weight on our lives. Firstly, see, we live in such a materialistic world that it's very difficult for us, you know. Uh, we've got to literally, you know, confess, pray, tell yourself every day who you are, what you are in Christ, so that those things do not intervene. I don't know if I said it the last time I was here. I think I may have said it, you know, but I'll say it again. One very important aspect of our Christian walk that we must be aware of every single day, every moment is this. That till the day we go to be with the Lord, or till the Lord comes to take us away, this man has a carnal side and a spiritual side. If you say, my carnal man is dead, I have nothing more now, you're fooling yourself. 
Every day he will trip you up. And you have to decide to let the spirit man decide and not the carnal man. It's a battle we fight every day. But we have the advantage of God's word, of God's spirit, and the knowledge of it to be able to overcome this carnal man. And he's the one that will add these weights to us. But yeah, we can't help ourselves. You know, Amazon. I bet if I say, let me see your phones, everyone will have an Amazon something on it. We can't help it. Well, that's not the problem, actually, because it makes it very convenient for us. Praise God for that, you know, uh, app or whatever it is. But I'm just saying, because things are easy, we tend to get drawn into it easier. The things that are difficult, we step aside from, right? It's a natural man's reaction. To walk in God's word is not easy. But that's where we have to put our faith, believe, trust. Because that is the truth and not the rest of it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. End of story. No? So these weights that are constantly pulling us down, things of the world, cares of the world, worries of the world, you know, we've got to train ourselves to let's, let them just, you know, don't, 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 they should not take any kind of uh, precedence in our day. Our mind must be set on the Lord Jesus Christ and his presence and his word, knowing that whatever things we need, whatever things we are going through, health issues, needs of stuff, the word of God has the answer. It has the answer. But can we trust it and dwell by it? That is the question. You know, Jesus said, oh, look at the lilies of the field. They don't sow, they don't reap. Uh, they don't weave, but even Solomon, the richest king known, in all his glory, is not arrayed like one of these. And the birds of the air. And he says, if I can take care of these things, would I not take care of you? Or you of little faith? See, it's so hard for us to trust those scripture verses. And to dwell and live by it. Because it's something that is not common to the natural world. And the natural mind says, don't be silly. How can you live like that? That's just, you know, just something he said, you know, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt. But that's what the devil says. The truth is, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Without God's word, we have nothing. And with God's word, we have everything. And that is why it's important to understand and receive every promise of God, adding faith and belief to all the scriptures. You know, sometimes, once I remember, I was, I, I took my, I have my Bible on my phone here, like many of you do, and I was preaching, and somebody said, you know, pastor, you're preaching, you should have a nice big Bible, you know, carry the Bible. So I said, yeah. I said, well, those days, of carrying the Bible has progressed to having five Bibles in this little thing. What is better? No, but the Bible, Holy Bible, you know. Bible, Holy Bible. I said, the Bible is not holy unless you apply faith and belief to every scripture word. Otherwise, it's just a book printed in some printing press in some corner of I don't know where. 
But when we add faith to those words, then it becomes power and life and, and transforming power for anything that we need. That's the beauty of it. So, you know, we must be able to know the differences between things and not get caught up with, you know, that carnal man's thinking and ways. Because it will prevail if we allow it. And getting rid of these weights is of utmost importance to us so that we can concentrate on God's word and seek its completion in our lives. Just confessing is of no use. Just knowing God's word and promises of no use. But confessing with faith and expectation, you receiving it is what is necessary. A farmer, like the Bible says, he does not put down seed and forget about it. He puts down seed and then the ground... You can't see anything. But yet he's there every day watering. He's there every day then till a little bit comes up and then he chases the birds away and things. And he's always watching, watching, watching with expectancy. God expects that from us too. If you want to receive from God's word. And then it goes on to say... After it says, lay aside every weight, it says, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. This is a mystery. It says, the sin. It doesn't say sins. So what is the sin that it's talking about? And I was wondering, I said, Lord, what is this sin that so easily besets us? What is this sin that is... You know, you're talking about just this one sin that is so dangerous to us. And I realized that the sin is the sin, the greatest sin of unbelief. It's unbelief. And, you know, very, when we often do this, we say, you know, Unbelief, you know, unbelievers, they don't know, they don't believe. But that's not true. The Bible is speaking to the believers, to the church of God. And why, do it, why does it say unbelief then? How can it be? I believe, we all believe, we confess, we read, we pray, we worship, we do everything that the word of God says. How can you say unbelief? If I can't, Believe that God is my provider. As he spoke in Matthew, that is unbelief. If I don't receive a promise that God has given in his word, that is unbelief. When the Israelites were saved from Egypt and went into the wilderness, God said, I take you to a land of milk and honey. And ten, 12 spies went and 10 came and said, no, no, nothing there. We can't go in there. Unbelief. What was the unbelief? They would not believe what God said. But two said, no, no, it is exactly as you said. And the Bible says, those that had unbelief perished in the wilderness. Unbelief is the thing that will draw us away from receiving from God, from walking with God, and finally even losing out on what God had given from the very beginning. We got to be careful. See, I'm sorry to say, but I find a lot universally Christians all over the world are very careless with their walk with Christ. Careless, why? Because they sit relaxed in that place that says, I'm saved. I don't have to do anything more. Well, maybe today uh, uh, I'm going to tell you, you have a lot to do. You have to walk and obey God's word, without which you 
will lose out on everything God has promised. You know, we have that famous scripture that we all like to, to you know, say and confess. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And everybody says, Hallelujah! But that's not the end of the sentence. It says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Who walk not after the flesh. Don't let that carnal man tell you what to do, but let your spirit man who is alive and loves the Lord and loves the word and wants to worship, let him decide. Amen. We got to do that. We got to be aware. We have to constantly be aware of our situation and who we are and what we are because every day, if we allow ourselves to fall into that carnal man self, we are going to wake up, you know, worrying about our clothes a face, uh, a work, a uh, uh, uh business, and everything else except God's word for me today. God's way for me today. And I'm not just, you know, saying things, you know, out of random. I mean, you read the scriptures and you'll find all those who followed Christ, you know, they, they just dropped everything and just followed him. So, it's very important that we understand, okay, that unbelief is a big part in the church. So, we got to, if we are aware of it, if you are aware that there's a hole here, you're not going to walk into it, right? You're going to go around it. If you are aware that unbelief could affect me, I'm going to put more faith, I'm going to pray more, that I will confess the word and receive my promise. And I'm going to train my mind. I'm going to train myself. Acts 1.8, beautiful, I love that scripture verse. It says, and after that you have received the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. What power is he talking about? Power such that can change things around you. Power miraculous. And you will be my witnesses unto... You know, it's a fabulous scripture verse here. It says, you will be my witnesses unto both. There's a word there that says both. Both means two. Right? And then it says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. So what, what both? I mean, there's four things there he's talking about. And I wondered, and I said, Lord, what? you say both, and then you say four things. God said, yeah, read it again carefully. So I read it ten times over, till the Holy Spirit told me, Jerusalem is separate from Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. The temple of God dwells inside of us. We are the temple of God. First witnesses to Jerusalem. First witnesses to Jerusalem. And it is the overflow of the word that will go into Judea, Samaria and the rest of the world. If I am full up, it's just going to flow over. I can't help it. But if I'm dry, I'm struggling to find something to tell you and tell you, to pray with you, to worship, to do all kinds of things. Very difficult it becomes. So, I've got to train myself first. Because if I am in the right place, people around me will be blessed. Pastor said in the morning, he said, don't be selfish. Give of yourself. Be a blessing. You wake up in the morning and say, Lord, today I want to be a blessing to others around me. Not just looking to say, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. Lord, I need a blessing. No. We are blessed. We have life eternal. We have everything we can ever ask for which we could not afford. 
Let us be a blessing. Like he said, give the name of Jesus. What greater gift can you give to somebody? But the name of Jesus. I love that. In fact, that, that, that's one of my favorite where Peter says, silver and gold, I have none. And I think to myself, that beggar must have looked at him and said, and what the heck do you have? <laughs> silver and gold, I have none. Then please carry on, he must have said. But Peter said, look at me. What I have, far greater than silver and gold, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man leapt and walked. Hallelujah. Wow. You know, we go on the roadside and you see the beggars at the corners asking for some money. How many of us ever said something about the gospel to them? You know, there's a eunuch in Pune who met me at a corner like this asking for money. And I took out some money and then I told him or her or whatever about Jesus. And now, every time he sees me, he comes running. So it gives me a chance to tell him more and more. And I believe one day he's going to be saved. <laughs> we have nothing else to give. But we have the most precious thing to give and we're not doing it. That is unbelief. Fear. God says, you got to be bold and courageous to speak the word everywhere, anywhere, anytime. Because you are not wasting time, you are giving life to people. You are giving them hope and courage, something that the world is not aware of. And so we say, you know, that we got to have belief and faith attached to God's word to receive every promise. I find a lot of believers, you know, we, we literally plod through our days. Praise the Lord, brother. Yeah, hallelujah. What's happened? Oh, you know, this thing, that thing, this problem, the work, my this, my that, my that. You know, I, uh, in fact, my wife gave me something beautiful. She said there was this man walking along, and he saw a guy laying bricks. So he went up to him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm laying bricks. You know, with a sarcastic look. I'm laying bricks, man. He said, okay. He went a little further around the corner. The other guy was there. And that guy with a smile on his face, is, you know. So he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. What a difference of opinion. What was his vision? The cathedral. And with joy, he was building, putting brick after brick after brick. You know, this fabulous scripture verse says, Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know what? The cross was, and the and the and the pain and the struggle, and the, and the, you know, uh, it says shame, that he endured. He had to be sin for the rest of us. We did the rubbish, and Jesus had to take the, take the blame. Every one of us, he took the blame. The pain of becoming sin for a holy God who the Bible says his eyes are purer than to even look upon iniquity was the worst thing that Jesus could have to go through. But what did Jesus do? He looked at the joy that was set before him. He said, one day, all these people are going to be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I love that line. Uh, you know that famous song that goes on, Mary, did you know? I sing it along all the time. And he says, this little child has come to make you new. This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Wow. 
amazing. And you know something? Mary understood it perfectly. Mary understood it perfectly. And she received, because the Bible says, on the day of Pentecost, she was there also with all the rest in the upper room to receive the Holy Spirit. For the joy, what are we looking at in our walk? Do we have joy walking as a believer or are we just plodding through our day saying, oh, we'll wait when Jesus comes or takes us or whatever? Do we know that Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not true, I wouldn't tell you. And I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am you may be too. What better place to be than to be with the Lord Jesus in that fabulous place he's talking about? Paul says it beautifully. He says to be present in this body is to be absent from God. But to be absent from this body is to be present with God. Hallelujah. I tell you there's a fabulous place in store for you and me. When we close our eyes or if the Lord comes first, I don't know. There's a wonderful place in store for us that we must be aware of. You know, many people say, oh, but you know, we'll just be like, you know, spirits here and there and everywhere. So I said, yeah, well, I don't know because the word of God says there are many mansions. I prepare a place for you. He says, there's roads, there's a gate, there's all kinds of things. And I said, why would a spirit need all that? If I'm a spirit being, I'll just, you know, why would, it, why would all these things be mentioned? And then I was thinking to myself, do I really understand salvation? Do we understand salvation? Jesus, the Bi Jesus said, John 3.16, famous scripture verse says, you know, God so loved the world that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have why everlasting life? Why would he give us everlasting life? Well, the answer is, because he created us to live forever. He created us to live forever in the Garden of Eden, that beautiful place that had everything that we ever needed. We would never have to work a day of our lives. Now, do you think that God would allow Satan to destroy that plan? To have a victory over him in any way? No! No! So he's going to bring us back through salvation to that place again. Only then will he have defeated the devil truly. Only then. Because if we don't get back to that place, the whole plan and purpose of God in creation will be defeated. And how do we know that we were made to live forever? Very simple. The Bible says at the time of creation, God created Adam and Eve and all that thing and he put them in the garden and the beautiful garden and he walked with them and talked with them and he said, you see that tree? I don't want you to eat of that tree. He said, one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat from that tree because on the day you eat of it you will surely die now the bible says you know they were deceived satan came deceived them they ate of the fruit and what happened they were cast out of that garden of eden because they had sinned against god in disobedience but it doesn't end there in the third chapter it says and god then sent an angel with a flaming sword that turns always to guard the tree of life lest 
the man who is in sin should eat and live forever. So it was God's plan that man should eat of the tree of life and live forever because he didn't tell Adam and Eve it's there. He said, everything's for you, only that tree you don't eat of. The plan of God was that he should eat and live forever only when he sinned. He sent an angel and said, take away the tree, guard it so that he may not eat now that he's in sin. And the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. We began to die, perish. But then God said, what do I do? I've tried everything. I gave them a system of sacrifice and this and that. Nothing's working. He said, I have to save the people, the children I created. I have to save this man that I created, that has my life in him. So he came, sent his only begotten son, Jesus. You know, this also is a, is a, is a fabulous thing because, you know, Everybody says, we, we get, many people are confused about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I think, for the sake of us and our understanding, God, Jesus said the Father, and he said the Holy Spirit, but they're all just one. They're just one. All together. Always. In everything. I and my Father, we are one. No, the Holy Spirit was the anointing of Jesus, the Bible says. So they were always together, never separated. And now when Jesus came, what did he do? He took away the sin that was causing us to die, right? But there's something beautiful on that Calvary that happened. There were two thieves on either side of him. And one said to him something, okay, we won't go into that. The other said, Lord, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Jesus, the Bible says, that's the only time Jesus must have turned and looked at him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And I said, Lord, what is this paradise? Where is this paradise? I want to know, why are you saying paradise? Why didn't you say heaven? Why didn't you say you'll be with me in the new heaven and earth? Or in heaven, you said paradise. So I started studying, searching, find, you know, trying to figure out what. And it, I found out that the word paradise comes from a Persian dialect that means the garden of God. Because the Persians believed their kings were gods. And it says garden of God. I said, wow. Fantastic. And then as I read, 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 Revelations 3 says, To them that overcome, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life that stands in the paradise of God. Hallelujah. Where is the tree of life? In paradise, in the garden of God. And that's why the thief, Jesus was taking him there. He took him there, to paradise. Before Jesus died and rose again. There's another little story there about Lazarus and the poor beggar at his gate. Remember that one? And they both died and Lazarus went to heaven or went somewhere. And the rich man went to hell, the Bible says. And then he looked up and he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Now that's a different place altogether. Right? And I said, Lord, Abraham's bosom. Paradise. God said, yeah. Till Jesus rose again, all those who were saved had a place to stay and wait till the coming of the Savior and the resurrection. And I believe those that were there now have gone to paradise to eat of the tree of life. It's, it, it's that simple. There's no complications in it. And now that it is complete and I understand the salvation story, I can rejoice in it. 
I'm so happy now. I know where I'm heading. I know I can see the place I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. That beautiful place, I believe, might even be like the Garden of Eden. People say, ah, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible says, if you read carefully, God only created the heaven and the earth and the man from the mud. Everything else, he said, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Why was he saying let it be? What he was saying is, let it be from the unseen seen here on earth. And Paul understood it. So he said, the invisible things of God are known by creation. So we look around us and then you say, oh yeah, of course, God talks about trees and he talks about uh, animals and horses and bears and everything. What we have here or what was in the Garden of Eden came because it's there in that place where God is. Very possible that you and I will be back there again to complete the circle of salvation. To complete the victory of God over Satan. And I want you to excite yourself because the Bible says, you know, that on that day, the Lord will come with a trump, with a trumpet sound. No? And a shout. And those who are dead in Christ will rise first. Then you and I who are on this earth will be caught up with him. To be with him forever. What better place are we seeking? We are looking to, you know, to get a house here on this earth, to buy a piece of land here, which is going to be destroyed and going down the drain. We are looking to, to have a bank account, bank, big bank balance, so that, you know, when I die, somebody else is going to enjoy the money. <laughs> and it's very sad because, you know, I see a lot of children, young children, whose fathers and mothers have stored up a lot of wealth, they, they don't follow in the father and mother's footsteps. They go down a different path because everything's easy to them. And they start in drugs and, and you know, gambling and all. Because it's so easy. I, I never worked for it. It's just there for me. So we need to understand that if we see that perfect picture of where we're going to be. This walk on this earth will not be a troublesome one. You will not labor walking every day. You will rejoice and enjoy yourself when you wake up in the morning. You'll wake up with a joy. You say, I got one more day to go. Maybe God will come. I don't know today. Maybe the Lord will come today. You know? And even if I close my eyes today, oh, wonderful, hallelujah, I'm going to be with the Lord. Don't be afraid of this world. Don't be afraid of the things of this world. People are struggling and paying through their noses just to have a few more years on this earth. For what, I don't know. When the Bible says this earth is fading, it's, it's, it's going to be destroyed, it's going away. The only thing, and, and very well defined in the word of God, it says, heaven and earth will pass away. But... My word will never pass away. Hallelujah. Those who cling to God's word, they have a lifeline to God. Amen. Something they can just cling on to. That will always bring them to the God. And that is why when we have a picture of where we are heading, the walk on this earth will not be laborious, but a joyous one. The working on this earth will be a joyous one. Those who are ministering will minister with joy in their hearts, with a hope and a courage knowing, I have a place I'm heading to that is so beautiful, I don't have time, I don't know how much time I have, let me do my best. They won't think, oh, this is everything here on earth, so I can take my time. No, somebody beautifully said, don't wait till the 11th hour to receive Christ. He might come at 10.45. That's the truth. No? He said, I'll come like a thief in the night. So we got to be careful. We got to be prepared. We got to have faith. 
Don't let unbelief dwell in our heart. Don't let the weights of this world pull us down. Keep the vision of the place you're going to be because it's a glorious place only those who have receiving Christ are going to. That's why the Bible says it's a narrow way and a few travel down it. But broad is the way to destruction and many are going down that road. It is our duty to tell them about the narrow way. It is our duty to tell them joyously with hope. See, if, if my life is a life of, of joy and, and blessing and miracles and the power of God, everybody will want to listen to me. If my life is a dead one, who's going to listen to what I have to say? They say, look at you, man. You're half dead there yourself. You don't, can't do this, you can't do that, you can't go here, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. No, today's world, don't eat this, don't eat that, this is that, that, sugar, salt, whatever, I don't know. But the Bible says, as far as I'm concerned, everything with prayer and sanctification is good for you, it cannot be bad. Do not fear the world, fear God's word. Let his word take precedence in your life. Don't be afraid to eat well. Pray over it. It cannot be bad if God says it is good. Receive healing. The Bible says the word of God is health to my being. My whole being. So I'm going to use and read the word and say, Thank you, Lord, for health and strength. If I don't do these things with faith and belief, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to struggle in the world. I'm going to have a laborious walk on this earth. Maybe I will go to be with the Lord when a time comes. But the, my whole walk will be, you know, one of so sad and sorry story. But the Bible says, store up treasure in heaven. What treasure? The treasure of doing what God asks us to do here on this earth. Do that. That we may be rich in Christ. And that God may rejoice when he says, Come, my good and faithful servants. Come into my rest. Wow, how we long to hear that. So keep that vision before you. That it's a glorious place. So that you may endure this walk on this earth. Because it's going to bring a lot of obstacles. Like Jesus. But he endured and he says he despised the shame that he bore. Wow. We are so conscious of ourselves, no? All of us. Little bit something happens. Are you don't see it. Don't tell anybody. Quiet. Jesus never said that. He didn't care about it. He didn't care about it. He just did what he had to do to accomplish what he could accomplish because he was looking at the joy that was set before him. And I tell you, that joy is seated. A part of it is seated in this church today. The Lord Jesus is so excited, so happy, so joyful. He says, my sacrifice, look, he says, this is a small part of my family. Wow. Let us have that same joy. That this walk on this earth won't be laborious one. But it will be a one filled with joy and fruitfulness, blessedness. Be a blessing every day. Don't just look for blessing. Be a blessing. Amen? Because that's what children of God are called to be. Blessings. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. Wow. You know, I always say to people, take away light and salt. What do we have on this earth? Nothing. Horrible. Darkness and no taste in our food. Oh my God. You and I must know what God is saying to us. We must know who we are, what value we carry, what power and authority we carry, what blessedness we carry and give to others. Don't, let me end with pastor's word, don't be selfish. Be selfless. Amen. Praise God. All glory to Jesus. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for this morning, for the wonderful time we've had and through worship and through the exhortation and all of those things, Lord, just to be with your children and your family, knowing you are present, Father, I pray. Let every heart that is in need, every mind that is tormented, every person that is in any way uh, needy of anything, Lord, let them seek you now that they may receive their miracle here and now in Jesus' name. For you are the God of power and might. And we ask the God of miracles. And we ask even as Peter we speak and say, Be healed in the name of Jesus. And we say, Receive what you need. Every lack, let it be filled in Jesus' name. And let everything that is an obstruction in your life be removed in the name of Jesus. That you may walk with joy in your heart. And be a blessing each day unto those around us. Bless us and be with us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.